these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again.
was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. be 
darkness tremble. You silence our fears. God, if there is fear in our heart, I pray that we would give it to you and in its place, we would have thankfulness and gratefulness, Lord, because they cannot exist together. Fear and worry and anxiety cannot exist at the same time as gratefulness and thankfulness for what you've done and who you are. I pray that we would seek you with all that we are, Lord, that we would come before you and not focus on ourselves, but direct our focus to you, Lord. Be with us this week. Help us to be an encouragement to others, Lord. And just open our hearts to what you have to speak to us today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, if, you, if you don't have a, well, it looks like nobody needed a Bible, which means you all brought a Bible, either something like this or something like this. Yes, this is a pink iPad cover. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's something called digital demons that exist, and they run around, and one of them got into my printer. Uh, so being able to print up my, uh, my sermon notes this morning, which, who likes paper, reading on paper more than they like reading on, on digital? Yeah, do you, I might be a little weird, and I'm putting myself out there real quick. Um, do you guys like to smell your books? You, yes. you know, yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm not the only, I'm not the only one. We, yes, you can't get, you can't beat the smell of a good, I mean, it's just like, mm, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Um, Good morning, church. I am, uh, I am not Bob Cooper. I'm not that good looking, um, but I am younger. So maybe I have, may, you know, there's, there's still time for, for me. Um, my, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Um, everybody do this. Ready? Just go. Okay. This isn't a performance. This isn't, this isn't a concert and a TED Talk. This is the people of God gathering in the house to hear the word of God, to go out into the community and bring life and light into the community. Amen. There's no pressure here today. Okay, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for, for giving us the time and the, the, the space in your life this morning to be able to come. And I'm praying, I've been praying specifically for you, if you don't know Christ this morning, that you will come to, to life in Christ, that you'll be born again. Um, if you know Christ and you feel distant from him, I'm praying that this morning you would draw closer to him. If you're already close, I'm praying that you will continue to draw near to the Lord. We need more disciple makers in the church. Uh, so welcome. Thanks again, uh, Pastor Bob. Uh, if you're watching, thank you. Uh, if you go and watch the recording, um, thank you. It previously, how do you go in replay? Um, like I said, they're on they're on some some rest and relaxation right now. Um, they they really need it. You, they can they can come back refreshed. They can be full of the spirit. Come back and minister. Um, so well, my name is Michael Keen. Uh, I was here a few months ago, and we talked about four kids. Four kids is a foster care agency in the uh, in the the local area. Um, May is National Foster Care Awareness Month. Today is the first day of May. Um, so we wanna we wanna always let you know we we need you church we need you in the foster care community we need homes uh i think we needed like 17 homes uh this this past uh quarter to be able to to house children because there's children that are still sleeping in social worker offices are being shipped off uh ship, not shipped off they're being driven to other counties uh where there's where there's homes and that just makes that makes reunification very very difficult uh, so please, we need foster homes in the area. We need support. We need volunteers. Um, we have uh, many different ways that you can get uh, involved with foster care. Um, so there's a there's a, a slide up there. You can text foster to four seven four seven four seven. That's not committing you to anything. It's not saying uh, give us your money. That's that's just how can I learn some more about foster care? How can I get a little bit more involved? Because we need uh, we need those those types. Of, uh, of believers who are actually going to move from just sitting here on Sunday morning to actually doing something in their life. Again, my name is Michael Keen. Uh, there was a picture of my family up there, um, and I love my family so much. Um, they're the world to me. Um, I do have seven children. Um, three of them uh, are biologically for my wife and I, and the other four um, are just amazingly adopted out of, out of foster care, and they're my, my life, my light. Um, Last time I was here, 
uh, one of the little guys that my, my wife was holding, his name's Caleb, he was, uh, I think I told you, he was in the hospital, he was having a, a trach put in, he had, uh, he's, he came from medical foster care, so he had some, some medical challenges, um, his, his brain was, was having really just a hard time. Um, he ended up passing away on March 1st. Um, so while, while that is difficult, it's been hard for, for me and my family to go through this season. Um, the Lord has answered the prayer of giving him complete healing in heaven, and we take joy in that, that he has no more sorrow, no more pain. He's not, he's not regretting his life right now. He's looking down uh, on his life and saying, man, that, that's, my God is glorious because he's given me a testimony and he's welcomed me into the kingdom. So thank you for praying for us. Continue to pray for us as we navigate through that, as we navigate through the grief. Um, our children are doing well. Uh, my wife and I, we are doing well, but it is, it is a difficult season for us. Um, but I'm honored and humbled to be here to be able to minister to you guys um, because regardless of what happens here on earth, um, we know that Jesus is coming back, right? So there's pain, there's sorrow, there's death here on earth, um, but Jesus is coming back. He's going to wipe away every tear. He's going to make all things new. I haven't even started preaching yet, so I get to start my timer. Um, if, you, if you have a Bible this morning, I hope you do. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up to, uh, to John, the Gospel of John. That's where we're going to be this morning. Um, and while you're, while you're turning there, John chapter 3, and uh, I'm actually, I'm going to start a couple verses earlier in, in uh, 23, and we're going we're gonna to go through, go through John chapter 3. But turn there. Um, this might be a familiar passage to some of you. This might be a familiar chunk of scripture, and there's one verse in John chapter 3 that I'm sure very familiar to all of you. But what I want to encourage you this morning is do not listen to this message with ears of familiarity. Don't, don't, try to, don't try to say, oh, I know this, I know this, I've heard this, I've heard this. We need to press into the presence of God. We need to move into his word with an expectancy that he's going to do something new in our life. Amen? So don't, don't come in with, with an expectation of, oh, he's just going to tell me another sermon about John chapter 3 that I know and I memorize all the time. Come with expectancy. And for those of you who are not familiar with this passage, um, I also want to welcome you. Be open. If you don't know Jesus... I'm going to tell you about Jesus this morning. Um, I want you to see Jesus. I want you to know Jesus. We just sang all about Jesus. There's something that popped in my head. I was like, man, all these songs are about Jesus. Like, there's not, there's not like a hype or a motivational kind of speaker in this. This is about the word. The Calvary, what I love about Calvary, what I love about Pastor Bob, he cares about the word. He cares about Jesus, and he cares about you and your souls. So I want you to know Jesus. I want you to fall in love with Jesus I'm praying that you're born again. Let me give you permission. I'm a hollerback preacher, okay? So if you feel a need to holler back at me in a nice way, you can do that. That's fine, all right? You can do that. You, yes, please do, okay? And if I'm not doing good, just drum it up so that, you know, I can maybe do better. Um, so here's what I want to do. This is going to be the last time I'm going to ask you to do this, but please just, just go ahead and stand up if you can. Um, we're gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the entire passage, and just standing is just a way that we can honor the Lord. Whenever the president walks in, everybody stands up. Whenever a judge walks in, everybody stands up. Can we do that for the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Amen. John, starting in chapter 2, verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, if you're reading in the King James, it might say, Verily, verily. In the Greek, it's literally, Amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter in a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered and said, Ew, that's gross. <laughs> Jesus answered, truly, truly, amen, amen, verily, verily, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said this to you. You must be born again. 
The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we've seen and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And let me tell you this morning, that man is Jesus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus, will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world yet, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and that men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And last verse, 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. You can go ahead and take a seat if you want, but I'm going to pray. Jesus, we love you, God. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that right now that you would manifest yourself in this room, that as we read the words of Scripture, the eternal word, that the living word would be enlightened to us, would, would come inside of us, that we would welcome the light of the world into our hearts this morning, God. I'm praying that this morning would be a changing moment for some people in here, for every person in here, that this morning would change the course of their lives forever. God, I'm praying that revival would start right here and right now in this church with this people. May revival start in my heart. May revival start in the hearts of the people that are here and the families that are here, God. May revival move from this place to the churches in the Treasure Coast, to Southeast Florida, to Florida, to the nations, to the world. God, I am begging you. We need you. God, I don't want to mince words this morning. I don't want to say and try to drum up the presence of God by having clever tricks and things that are going on. Lord, I just want your word to go straight from heaven to earth into our hearts. Nothing else but you, Jesus. There's no other name that's higher than the name of Jesus, and we praise you this morning. God, I'm humbly just submitting this time May I get out of the way and may your spirit pour forth living water. Jesus, you, you promised that you would pour out living water. So would you do that this morning, God? If there's somebody in here that feels dry this morning, I'm speaking the living word over you, water of life that's in your soul this morning. God, help us. We need your help. We need your help. We need your help. We need your help. We don't want to be like Nicodemus and and not be able to grasp the spiritual things. God, open our eyes to the things of the Spirit this morning as we go through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. This morning, I don't have an astounding title. I don't have an alliterated three-point message like a good old Baptist preacher should. Um, I don't have fancy slides or props or skinny jeans and smoke machines. Um... (laughs) I seriously, I want to bring you the word of God, okay? I don't want to distract you with anything else other than the word of God because the word of God is what's able to save. Okay, I can come up with clever, come on, Jesus. (laughs) Woo! I can come up with clever things to say and memorization tricks and all this stuff, but I believe with my whole heart that the spirit has been doing his work regardless of technology for many, many years. So let's get into that. I want to bring you the word. The title of this message is, uh, is just going to be very simple, the new birth. And I'm going to give you the charge. If you want the whole sermon in a nutshell, here it is. I'm going to give it to you this morning. You can take this and then you can go. 
please don't do that. But if you wanted to, you could. Here's the, here's the whole message of the sermon. You must be born again. Let me say it this side. You must be born again. You must be born again. Not you ought to be born again. You must be born again. It's not optional. You must be born again. Far too often I see churches trying to drum up the presence of God and, and like, like he can be summoned like a genie in a bottle where you can get all of this fancy stuff going and it's hype and it's all this. I've been in meetings where we've had nothing but a Bible and a, a not tuned guitar and I have felt the presence of God come. We don't have to have that stuff. What he wants is your heart. I'm not against lights and smoke machines per se. Um, I, I will not wear skinny jeans, but um, I, you don't have to drum up the presence of God. You don't have to. And I'm praying that he's going to do something this morning, regardless of, of if technology goes well or not, because he's going to move in your hearts and he's going to do what he's going to do. John chapter 2, verse 23 now, when he was in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs which he was doing. Let me give you a little bit of context of kind of where we're at right now. Jesus had begun his ministry. Uh, this is the time of the Passover. He came from the wedding at Cana into Jerusalem. Um, the wedding at Cana, if you remember, that's kind of where his, his, his ministry of signs and wonders began. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 11 says this is the beginning of the works that he's doing. So he's coming from the wedding of Cana. He's just done a miracle there, and he's coming into Jerusalem. For the, for the Passover, but when Jesus arrived in uh, Jerusalem, he witnesses something um, that, that really stirred him up. He witnessed a defaming of his father's temple. If you remember, he comes into the temple and he sees money changers and people selling ox and dove and, and sheep and all this stuff for, for its Passover. You have to have an, a sacrifice. And, and back then, if people couldn't um, carry their sacrifice, what they would do is basically they'd go into town and, and buy a sacrifice so that they could do the ritual. But money corrupts, okay? Money's not bad. There's nothing bad about money necessarily, but it corrupts, okay? So he comes in and he sees this and he's, he's, he's torn because these people are treating his father's house like a business. So he comes in and he overturns the tables of the money changers and he, he makes a whip and drives people out. I mean, I can just imagine the disciples sitting there and Jesus picks up some cords. He starts tying them together and like, what is, Jesus, this is going to be a good sermon illustration right here. You know, they're thinking back in the Old Testament, a cord of three strands isn't easily broken. Jesus is tying his whip and then he just, he drives the people out because the scripture said, zeal for his father's house will, will consume him. So that's kind of the context that we're in right now. So we're moving on. So he's in Jerusalem. He's at this Passover. Uh, again, the, the Pharisees um, are the religious rulers of kind of the temple. Okay, so they're, they've, they've got the, uh, the, the standing of being ultra-religious, and people, people are looking to them for their, for their spirituality. Verse 24, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, uh, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And this is interesting because just previously in, in 23, it said that people were believing in his name. Many believed in his name, observing the signs that he was doing. So they were seeing this man do signs and wonders. They were believing in his name, but Jesus was doing something. He, he was withholding himself. He was not entrusting himself to them, and that's because he knew what was in the heart of man. He knew that. Let me tell you this morning, God knows what's in your heart. For some of us, that's a relief because we, we want to, we desire to know God. For some of us, that might be a little intimidating. God knows what's in my heart. But let me tell you this morning, he knows your heart, and we're going to read later, he loved you enough to do something about it. He loved you enough to do something about it. Although they believed, Scripture says, Jesus didn't entrust himself to him. He withheld himself. This message this morning is not for a particular set of people. It's not for believers, it's it, particularly. It's not for stale Christians, particularly. It's not for the not yet believers, particularly. This is for everyone because he knows the heart of God. So again, if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, I know that passage. Yeah, I know that passage. Ask the Lord to reveal something new to you this morning. Romans chapter 3 says, For all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Um, can anybody attest to that? Anybody? Yeah, if you haven't raised your hand, um, Scripture also said if, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. So um, <laughs> we can have fun at church, right? We can be fun. We can have fun. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, that's interesting, he came to him by night. Now there, you can kind of guess as to why either he didn't want to be seen, he was trying to protect his reputation, um, perhaps he was truly trying to figure out more about what this man named Jesus is doing, coming in here with signs and wonders and, and trying to figure it out, or perhaps he was trying to concoct a plan. Scripture's not clear at this point, but he says he came to him by night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. And here's the evidence for that that, that, that that Nicodemus gives. He says, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, that's interesting because Nicodemus is a teacher, but it doesn't seem like Nicodemus has the proofs and the evidences that he's been sent by God because he's dry. There's no, there's no effects in his, in his life other than robes and tassels and loud prayers. But he goes to Jesus, he says, we know that you're sent by God. No one can do that unless they're sent by God. And it's interesting that Jesus answers because Nicodemus hasn't asked a question yet. Normally when people give an answer, it's in response to a, a question. But Jesus answers and says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That kind of comes from left field. What in the world does that? Nicodemus just said, we see that you're a teacher. We know that you've come from God. But back up to, to verse 23 and 24, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. He knew what was in Nicodemus's heart. He knew the longing and the questions that Nicodemus actually had. He knew, where, he knew what Nicodemus wanted before Nicodemus came. Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me emphasize to you again this morning, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. There needs to be a new birth that happens in you. The kingdom of God is not inherited based on your mother and your father's Christianity. You're, the kingdom of God is not inherited simply because you come and sit in church on Sunday morning. And if you're super spiritual, you even attend an extracurricular Bible study one time throughout the week. That does not get you the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. You got to holler back at that. And that's, that's from the word. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now, when I was reflecting on this, I was like, Nicodemus, man, you can't be serious. Like, is that a serious question that you're going to ask a guy? Like, first off, it's just kind of gross. He's going to enter back into his mother's womb and be born again. But here's what Jesus knows about Nicodemus. G Jesus knows, Nicodemus, man, you're focused on the physical. You're focused on the physical right now. All you see is the physical. All you see is the law. And what you see in the law is not separating law from grace. What you see in the law is the works that you think you have to do in order to gain favor with God, in order to have a position with God, in order to have the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, no, Nicodemus, it's not the physical. You must be born again. Jesus answered this and said, truly, truly, and again, when Jesus said something, it's important. When Jesus says, truly, truly, it's really important. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Is Jesus being repetitive here? Yeah. Why? It's important. You must be born again. You must be born again. You have to be born again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, 
but you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. So is everyone who born, is born of the Spirit. I was meditating on that, and it was kind of, kind of hard to wrap my head around. What, what, is, what is Jesus talking about? And then I hear from the Lord, Michael, you're being Nicodemus. You're trying to figure it out. You're trying to... What, what does it mean to be born again? Jesus, Jesus doesn't give a physical description of it. It's like, it's like the wind. We, we feel the effects of it. We don't know where it's going or where it's coming from. I was, um, I was I had a conference this past week um, in Kentucky, so we flew on an airplane. Um, thank God that they lift the uh, mandate for masks like the week before we left. Um, but we flew on... Uh, on an airline, um, I don't want to say oddly enough, but God, godly enough, it's coincidentally enough, uh, Spirit. The airline we, we were riding on was called Spirit. Now, I don't fly very often, okay? So we get into the airport, finally made my way through there, um, and I look out, and there's this big old yellow airplane. Looks like a school bus with wings, and it's called Spirit. I'm like, huh, that's interesting, Spirit. So we're flying on Spirit. There's also an animal show, like animated show my kids used to watch called Spirit. It's like a little horse. Um, so we're flying on Spirit. That just reminded me when I said that. We're flying on Spirit. And if you've flown on a plane before, um, you know this feeling. And if you haven't, here's what happens. You, you get up and you're, you're flying and you're coasting. Everything seems pretty smooth. All of a sudden, you feel like you are driving down an old dirt road that hasn't been graded in like 20 years. You like feel like you hit a rock and a pothole and all this kind of stuff. So you look out the window, you're like, what is this plane running over 30,000 feet in the air? There's no rocks up here in the air. What? So you look out the window, there's nothing there, but the plane is going like this as you're flying. What in the world? What's that called? Turbulence. Turbulence. That's the wind patterns, and I'm not scientific enough to know exactly what it is, but there's obviously no rocks up there, but there's wind that's moving, and the airplane's hitting it at a certain direction. And, and that brought to my mind when, when I was meditating on this verse, um, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes or where it's going. So is everyone with the Spirit. You're not, you're not going to be able to just look at a person necessarily and know if they're born again. Sometimes God will give you discernment and say, that guy's a believer. I know that. I've had those experiences, right? You're kind of walking around and you're just like, man, I, there's something about you. The spirit of God is on you. I can, I can sense that. You can get that discernment. But a lot of times, what, you're, what are you going to look at to tell what somebody believes? Their fruit. The fruit, their actions. What's happening? How can you tell if somebody's been born again? You look at what they're doing with their life. If you're coming on Sunday morning, and I don't mean this in a con condemning way, please hear me, please hear my heart on this. It's because we love you, because I love you, because God loves you. If you're coming on Sunday morning, and that's it, and there's no change in your life, I wanna challenge you this morning. You must be born again. You have to be born again. I don't want you to walk out of this room if you know that you need to be born again without meeting Jesus. I'm going to give you an opportunity a little bit later to respond to that. And I'm praying that God would move on your heart if you need that, to give you the courage and the empowerment for you to accept and say, I can't do this on my own. If you're like me, if you're like me and you think, man, I, gotta, I have to have all the T's dot, crossed and I's dotted to be in the kingdom of God, let me break it to you. It's not going to happen for you. You, you aren't good enough. In yourself, you are not good enough. You don't have the works. You don't have the ability to be holy apart from the Spirit of God. You must be born again. Some of the effects I see of, of Christians who are born again is the way they give up their life. And, and in my circle, particularly, it's in foster care. Um, I'm the executive director now of Four Kids of the Treasure Coast, and we just had our spring picnic for our families uh, yesterday. We had um, close to 40, between 40 and 45 families come out with, with kids. I mean, you would, have, you would have thought there was 200 kids there with just like 40 to 45 families. It was, it was amazing. And I look around the room and I see the diversity and I see the love that these born again believers are pouring out on children to no fault of their own, have been displaced from their homes. They have 
behaviors and trauma that they're trying to deal with, and the families are saying, I'm gonna, they're worth it. Yes. They're worth it. I have to give up my life to do that. That's a part of my life. It do, I'm not calling you to do that exact same thing, but I'm challenging you. It's even more than giving $5 in the giving thing. Here I go asking for money again. But it is more than that. Is there a sacrifice in your life that demonstrates that you've understood and you've internalized the sacrifice of Jesus when he hung on a cross? Is there something in you that says, because my Jesus did that, I can go out and do something great? Is that in you this morning? First Peter says it like this. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He caused us to be born again. Let me again not mince words. You cannot cause yourself to be born again. You cannot in yourself drum up something and say, now I'm born again. The Lord will cause you to be born again. What does it take? Surrender, faith, repentance, calling you church, repent. You don't hear that word in church anymore. You don't hear this. You don't hear this coming from a pulpit very often. Repent and believe in Jesus for your sins to be forgiven. May revival come right here and right now because we are saying repent and be forgiven for your sins. There is new life in Christ. You don't have to have guilt and shame for your old life if you come into Christ. He died on the cross for you. He raised from the dead so that we could have a victorious life over sin. Your life's not going to get easier. My son died a few months ago. That's not easy. I can't go to the father and say, how could you let that happen? That boy did nothing. Have I sinned so much against you that you would take my son from me? I was there. I had that grief. But that's, that's not what Jesus died for. You know what he died for? Father, thank you for accepting Caleb into your presence. Because of your death on the cross, Caleb can now be with you in eternity. And because your death on the cross, when I die in this life, I can be with you in eternity and with Caleb in eternity. And our family can come back together in eternity. And that's only because of the cross. That's only because of the cross. And guess what? He didn't just die. He was put in a grave and he was raised from the dead. You name me one other person that was raised from the dead. And we get to look back. And this person that was raised from the dead said this. You must be born again. When a dead guy who's now living says something, you ought to pay attention. You must be born again. I'm going to, if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 real quick. I'm just, I'm going to try to give you as much scripture as I can. Um, again, not, be, not, I don't want to step in the way of, of the Lord. Here's, here's the thing. Do you believe that, that this word is sufficient? Do you believe the Bible is sufficient in all matters of truth and teaching? Okay, so I don't need to, to start giving more words than what, I don't need to try to improve on what scripture says. So, in my opinion, we're just going to read the word. So Ephesians chapter 2, you can read along with me. It's not going to be up on the screen. I'm kind of making you have your Bible in front of you. It's kind of like a preacher trick, uh, not putting it on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Ouch. That's who you were. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, but God, but God. Those are two of my most favorite words in the Bible. But God. But God, being rich in mercy 
because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. For grace you have been saved through faith. For grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your works so that no one can boast. Can I get an amen? amen. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Are you saved by your works? What are you saved for? You are saved for good works. You are not saved by your good works. You are not saved because you come to church. You are not saved because you go to a Bible study. You are saved because of grace through faith. If it was up to me, I would not be saved. If it were up to my own life, I would not be saved. When I get to eternity... If I did not have Jesus and he laid out, yes, I have seven kids. I've adopted them from foster care. I work in foster care. It's filthy rags before the Lord if you don't have Christ. Your works will be burned up if you don't have Christ, if they don't stand. Church, are you hearing me this morning? Please come to Christ. Be born again for good works. Take this message. If you know Christ now and you don't have to be born again, if you want to rededicate your life to Christ, we can do that. If, you don't, if you're not born again, but, but please take this message and go do something in the world. We need you, Christians. We need you. I'm going to keep going in, in Ephesians. Verse 14, Therefore, remember that formerly you, were the, uh, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, were called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at the time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing his... Uh, in his flesh, the enmity, which is the law, the commandments, and contained. Here's, here's another point I want to give you. The gospel, it's the great equalizer. The gospel is the great equalizer. This world is full of division. This world is, is full of this versus that. The gospel is the great equalizer. These children that come into our homes... The gospel is a great equalizer. Yes, they come from a rough background. The gospel is a great equalizer. I can't stand on my pompous horse looking down on these biological families saying, how could you do that? Because guess what? Without Christ, I was the same thing. I might not have done the same actions, but spiritually I was the same place. People ask me a lot, Michael, do you think that, do you think that humanity is essentially good or essentially bad? Like, what do you, what's your opinion? Do you think humanity in general is just, is good but does bad things or is essentially bad? I say no. I say neither. What do you mean? I think it's the wrong question. Here's the question of scripture. Are you spiritually dead or are you spiritually alive? And let me tell you the answer. When you're born, just like David said, born in iniquity, you're born spiritually dead as a result of the fall back in the garden Adam and Eve. That, that transgression comes through all of humanity. We are born dead. Yes. Spiritually dead. Not sleeping, yes. dead. Spiritually dead. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Do you have spiritual life? This morning is the morning that you can have spiritual life. God, work in the hearts. God, work in the hearts, please, of your people. Second Corinthians says like this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. 
Can you just look to your neighbor, look to your neighbor right now and say, you're a new creature if you're in Christ. Yeah. Yeah, you're a new creature. You're a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. There's a lot in the news right now about, um, about Disney. There's a lot in the news about Disney. I think we, we all know a lot about that. Some of us know more than others. Um, I'm not going to get into that discussion about uh, Disney and what is or isn't, um, but I want to make one, one point of that. I hear a lot of Christians... Um, today talk about what's happening in the world, and, and I was on uh, a, essentially it was like a 12-hour vacation, because I have too many kids to go away for any longer, a 12-hour thing at, at, uh, at, a, at a resort here in town, and we're sitting in the pool, and I, and I overheard conversations of people just talking about what's happening in the world, and COVID, and shutdown, and, you know, people are still talking about that, you know, um, and all sorts of stuff that's happening in the world, and Disney is one of them, Disney is a hot topic of this particularly in Florida, what's going on. And I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm like, I'm curious what, like, their solution, what solution they're going to offer. And I'm listening, and they're complaining, and I'm listening, and they're complaining, and I'm listening, and they're just, they're stating the facts that everybody know back and forth to each other. It's, it's interesting. Some guy's like, oh, yeah, this and this and this. And the other guy's like, oh, yeah, and this and this. They're just, like, spitballing facts that the two of them know. It's like, what kind of conversation is that? You're just, like, telling the other person what he already knows, and then you're hearing something that you already know, too. And I'm waiting. I'm like, where's, when's the solution going to come? When, when are they going to, when, they, they might not have one. When's the, where's the solution? Yes. Only God has a solution. But here's what, um, this is one of my favorite quotes by one of my spiritual, my spiritual heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King. This is what he said um, in a letter from Birmingham Jail. If you've never read that letter that he wrote in prison on newspaper, Please, there, uh, Audible has it, uh, like you can listen to it, and I would even encourage you to listen to it, because the person who produced it read it in such a passion that, that it, it's, it's amazing. But please just, just read that letter from Birmingham Jail that Dr. King said. And he said, uh, at, at one point, he said this in there. He said, there was a time when the church was very powerful, in the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Dr. King recognized church in that particular case, white brothers and sisters, you can tell me all you want about the injustice, but all you're doing is being a thermometer. You're just telling me what's going on in society. I already know that. He's, he's pleading with his brothers and sisters in Christ. Be a thermostat. Change society. Let me tell you right now, church, change society. Yes, I know that Disney is whack. Yes, I know that the government can be whack. Yes, I know that the public education system can be whack. I know that. We all know that. Stop being a thermometer. Stop telling each other what's happening. Do something about it. Do you realize that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you? You can do something about this. Romans 12.2. Commit this to memory. Romans 12.2. And do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Let's get back to, uh, to John chapter 3. i got to hustle a little bit here. Um, I don't think this is one of those meeting houses where we can do like three-hour sermons, right? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. I love it. Let's get back to, to verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you of earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Let me tell you right now, if your heart is not open to spiritual matters, you're, not, you're gonna think this guy up here is crazy. What is this dude talking about? The gospel is foolishness. The cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. If you've ever gotten up and, and preached or ministered or witnessed to somebody and had that feeling of like, man, they think I'm foolish. 
guess what? They might. They, they probably do think you're foolish. Because the cross is foolishness to them. Because they don't have eyes to see. They don't have ears to hear. But be encouraged that the Spirit of God can work on those people as you're preaching to them. It's amazing. I don't I feel qualified to come. I don't think any of us are qualified other than the, the anointing and the call of God to get up on a, on a platform, open up the eternal word of God that's infallible and inerrant and inspired and try to talk to it, talk about it with people. It's a very humbling and sometimes even humiliating thing to do to get up and preach and to be a preacher. Pray for your pastor. Pray for Pastor Bob. He's doing a calling that many people are not called to do and that some people are called to do and won't do because they feel the pressure of it. It's truly a humbling thing to open the word of God before his people. Nicodemus still can't figure this out. He's still asking questions. He can't grasp the reality that being born again is a transformation of the inner person. A transformation of the inner person. Verse 14, verse, verse 13, actually, let's go to verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And again, I'm going to tell you right now, the Son of Man, his name is Jesus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This reference may be kind of ambiguous to you um, if you don't know Scripture that well. This was very clear to Nicodemus being a preacher of the law. It comes from Numbers chapter 21. Um, I was going to read it, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go back. Um, so the, the Israelites are out in the wilderness. Um, they had just got into a, 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 a battle with um, a Canaanite king, and uh, some of their people had been taken captive, and, and the Israelites prayed. They said, Lord, if you will deliver us from these people, if you deliver us from these people, we will praise you. God delivers them moments later. And don't cast judgment on the Israelites because we do the same thing. Moments later, Numbers records that they start speaking against God and Moses. Just moments later. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. God does something miraculous in my life, and then I turn around and question, where are you? Remember. Remember the things that God have, has done. So um, this, is, this is what this is referring to. So uh, God sends kind of this plague on the Israelite people and sends fiery serpents into the camp and into, into the Israelites, into the people of God, into their camp. And these serpents are coming and biting people. And whoever was getting bitten was dying. So they called out to God. <laughs> they called out to Moses, we're sorry, forgive us. God, they, they said, Moses, intercede for us. Intercede for us. The ministry of intercession is one of the most neglected ministries in today's church. Intercession. What is intercession? That's a whole other sermon. Intercession, it's one thing to go to men before God, like I'm doing right now. It's a completely different thing to go to God before men. If you, when you, the ministry of intercession is standing in the gap between people and God and asking God to have mercy on these people, even though they did nothing to deserve it. So what, what, is, what is Moses here from the Lord? God tells him to uh, create this, this brass, uh, bronzed image uh, of a serpent and put it on a staff and hold it up. And he says, if, if anybody who's bit comes and looks upon the serpent that's lifted up, uh, he, he, he will have life. He will live. He will, he will be healed. So, so Jesus brings this illustration to, to Nicodemus and says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Let me ask you a question. Was that bronze serpent what saved the life of those people? No. Who were they actually looking to? Who, what is Scripture saying to look to for healing? Jesus. Jesus is telling Nicodemus very explicitly right now, there is healing in my name. I must be lifted up for you to live. Again, church, you must be born again in Christ. In Christ. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
I'm going to read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For those of you who don't have life in Christ right now, I'm speaking this to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It can't get more clear, and you may think I'm being redundant, but so is Jesus. You must be born again. There is life in Christ, in Jesus, no one else. There is no name that's been given to men on earth that is higher than the name of Jesus, and that's the name that we must be saved. Jesus, Jesus. Look to your number, your, mem- your, your neighbor, and say, Jesus. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. We see that, don't we? Men love darkness. Women love the darkness rather than the light. Don't be surprised they're not saved. They're not believers. Why are we expecting non-Christians to do the things that Christians ought to be doing, but most of the time aren't doing? You don't expect a dog to meow like a cat. Why? Because it's a dog, not a cat. People who are doing wickedness are not saved. They're children of wrath. Whew, you don't hear that anymore, do you? If you are not in Christ, you are a child of wrath destined for destruction. There is a, let me tell you right now, there is a real place called hell. And if you are not in Christ, you will find yourself there. You will. That place was not created for us. That place was not created for the human race when God created us. That place was created for the fallen angels, if you didn't know that. But if you're not in Christ... If you're not in Christ, you can't be truly human. You think, think about that a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. If you're not in Christ, you're not what God created you to be. You are, you are you're, something, you're something else. In Christ, you're a new creation. We need to be in the presence of God. We need to become holy for he is holy, and that's only through the name of Jesus. Verse 20 and 21, we'll end it on this. For everyone who does uh, evil hates the light and does not come to the light for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. Why do you think sin is done in the dark? But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. As having been wrought in God. We are saved for good works. We are saved saved to do something. Not just come and sit at church. Not just go to a Bible study. You're saved to give up your life. Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I'm living according to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do you see the juxtaposition of death and birth? Like, it's, it's interesting. Jesus is saying, be born again, have life. Scripture continues to say, you must die to live. You have to die to live. You have to die to live. I'm going to end it with this uh, story. And if the worship team wants to come up, um, we'll, uh, we'll end it like this. But I was... Um, we spoke about Disney a little bit earlier, and I was, I was actually, I stumbled upon, somebody told me about this interview um, with an animator from Disney, and uh, I was curious about it, so he explained a little bit. Um, his name's Glenn Keane, and he was the animator for the movie Beauty and the Beast. Um, you know, the, everybody knows the movie. Beauty and the Beast, and in this interview, they're talking about that, that transition scene where, where the beast kind of transforms and there's this big climactic things that happen and he comes into being the prince that that he once was and it was it was interesting as I was listening to Glenn 
start to um, describe his inspiration for, for this piece. Because a lot of times we're thinking, oh, you know, animators are getting inspiration from other art and other movies and things like that. And he got some from, from that. But listen to what he said. Listen to what Glenn Keane, an animator for Disney, who animated one of the most climactic scenes in Disney, listen to what he said. As I started animating it, I realized that for me, it was really an expression of my spiritual life. There's a verse in the Bible that says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. I wrote that on my exposure sheet as I'm drawing because it's really about an inner spiritual transformation that's taking place with the beast. And I saw it as a parable for my own life that I got to express in that scene. It was sincere. It was real for me. It was real for the prince. I don't know that there's ever an illustration more clear as to what really can take place in a person's life spiritually than this animated character transforming from an animal to the prince. Church, this morning, that same transformation can happen. That same transformation can happen. If you're in this place this morning and you're far from God, if you've never known God, if you've never seen God, if you haven't been born again from above, from God, this is the moment. This is the time. This is the place. If you're here this morning and you know God, you are a born again believer, you have salvation and you know that and you're secure in that, but there's a dryness in your bones. There's a dryness in your life. This is the time, this is the place to receive that living water that Jesus is. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You can receive that light. You can receive that living water that can be poured out. If you're in here this morning and you're on, you're on track, man, you're doing great with God. You are close to him. You feel him. You're with him. I wanna challenge you this morning. What in your life can you sacrifice? What in your life is God calling you to sacrifice to change this community? Let's go ahead and bow real quick. And I don't wanna pass up this moment. I don't wanna pass up this opportunity. I, I think a lot of times we rush through these moments and, and don't really let the Spirit of God at work and, and do what He's supposed to do. And I don't want this moment to be a, a conjuring up of something that's not real, but I do want to make space for the presence of God and the Spirit of God in this moment. If you're in here this morning and you need new life, you're saying, I can't do this anymore. I'm lost without you. I don't know which way I'm going. I need to be born again. If that's you this morning, can you just shoot your hand up real quick? Because I wanna, I wanna pray for you. There's no pressure. There's no embarrassment. We're all in the same, we're, we've all been in the same spot. We've all had to be born again at one point. We've all had to respond to that call at one point. So if that's you, I want you to respond. I don't want you to leave this place without responding. If you're in this, uh, time right now and you feel a dryness in your bones, you feel like there's something that's that's kind of missing, would you be open right now to the Spirit of God to touch you and, and bring revival to your heart? If you're in this place and you're walking with God and you're close to Jesus, would you have the humility to take a real good look internally at your life? Say, what are the areas, God, that you're calling me to sacrifice? I can tell you right now, Scripture says, pure and undefiled religion before God is this, to care for the widows and the orphans in their distress. Maybe that's for you this morning. If you want to partake in pure and undefiled religion before God, it's caring for the widows and the orphans. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. God, we say you are good, you are holy. You've drawn us out from a kingdom of darkness and placed us into a kingdom of light. 
out of the darkness and into the marvelous light, we run to you, Jesus. May this be a day that's marked in our hearts as a changing point that we can go out and, and reach this community. I'm still praying, God, that revival would start right here, right now, that there would be revival that takes place in the church, and may it start in this area right here. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. worship his name one more time.
some donuts and coffee and if you would like some prayer we have prayer partners as well have a great week